Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and good afternoon to, to our transatlantic participants. Uh, um, I'm Anna Fotyga, member of the European Parliament, Polish member of the European Parliament, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, the ECR group within the European Parliament, I warmly welcome all of you. Uh, we just uh, start our series of debates uh, uh, under the common title um, for Forgotten Leaders uh, Who Built Our Europe. Today we want to, to present the late uh, uh, colonel, or I should say general, Richard uh, Kuklinski, who was uh, uh, rightly called as first pole in uh, the NATO alliance. Uh, it is my pleasure and, and privilege uh, to welcome our today's distinguished speakers. First is His Excellency Tomasz Szatkowski, Polish uh, ambassador to, to NATO. Then we have uh, Mr. Filip uh, Franskowiak, uh, who uh, is the director of, of museum dedicated to, to uh, General Ryszard uh, Kukliński. And uh, then we have uh, two excellent uh, MEPs, uh, members of uh, the ECR group, uh, Alexander, Alexander Vondra, uh, former Deputy Prime Minister of uh, Czech uh, Republic, uh, former Foreign and Defense uh, Minister, and what is more important, uh, former dissident uh, under communist rule in Czechoslovakia. Very well welcome. And last but absolutely not least is our Spanish colleague, member of the European Parliament, who, who um, belongs to the Vox uh, party in, in uh, Spain. And he used to be a journalist, uh, also uh, traveling to, to our region, to, to Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Europe and having uh, also reflection on, uh, reflections on this uh, dark time uh, in our history. Ladies and gentlemen, just behind me, you, you see the permanent uh, exhibition that is uh, presented in my Gdańsk office. I, Gdańsk is part of my constituency in Poland. And this exhibition is uh, dedicated to, to the visit of Colonel Ryszard Kukliński to Gdańsk, uh, open invitation of former political prisoners of, of communist time in Poland, uh, Solidarność uh, leaders uh, and, and people who, who, who still cherish uh, uh, the best tradition of Poland's fighting for independence and Poles fighting for independence. Without much ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to, 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 to give the floor to His Excellency Tomasz Szatkowski, Polish ambassador to, to NATO. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Minister. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor, uh, it's a pleasure, but it's also a very important subject. Thank you very much for bringing it up to the uh, light. I think it is important not only as an account of the human bravery, but also uh, the strict consequences and the background of um, actions of, of John Kuklinski were um, uh, had pro profound uh, impact on the uh, on the development of, uh, of of the Cold War and its successful uh, end, and I would argue also they um, they are relevant um, uh, today, and I will try to explain br briefly uh, why. 
Um, of course, I I am aware that um, the um, contribution of um, uh, Jan Kuklinski is still very much um, classified. Not all of what he delivered has been um, uh, declassified uh, from the archives, but nonetheless, we can make uh, certain assumptions from statements of um, former uh, high-level officials of that uh, time uh, and uh, the influ influence on on the evolution of the NATO doctrine at that time. Uh, to give some um, background, I will just start to, start to say what was the strategic situation in the 70s. Basically, the Soviets have, uh, and the Warsaw Pact uh, in general, have enjoyed conventional superiority in Europe that was widely recognized, and that was coupled with aggressive uh, intent. The assumption for Soviets was that um, in a moment of opportunity, they could un unleash that superiority under the umbrella of strategic nuclear parity. The assumption was the United States would not be uh, would not risk its own security to um, uh, initiate a nuclear uh, war in in a um, defense of Europe. Um, th that um, led initially to the response on uh, on the NATO side by developing tactical nuclear um, arms. Uh, which were to offset possible um, uh, breakup of, the, of NATO's uh, defense. But then in turn, uh, the Soviets um, uh, took another step. They developed um, sub-strategic missiles and deployed them to Eastern Europe. Those missiles were SS-20 and SS-21 and other uh, systems. And those would, could certainly off, not only offset tactical nuclear uh, warheads of NATO, but also hold at risk uh, European cities and basically, again, threaten this transatlantic um, uh, link. Um, NATO's response initially was to um, develop countermeasures, Pershing-1 missiles, Pershing-2, um, other nuclear-tipped missiles that were, that were very effective. But now, now let me turn to the effect of that situation on Poland, because Poland um, could have become um, uh, a basically a common fodder for um, Soviet Union's aggressive uh, plans against the will of the of, of the people. Um, the Polish uh, People's Republic Army would be used uh, in the first echelon of the attacking uh, forces um, and certainly would uh, suffer huge casualties. But that wouldn't be the only price that Poland would have paid for the Soviet ag aggressive intentions. There would be uh, the Polish population because because of the territory and, and because of the strategic logic. Uh, if had not a, NATO been forced to try to block second and third echelon of Soviet forces, they would have probably preferred to, to uh, strike um, on the territory of Eastern Germany and Poland. And, and then, um, and in spite of um, high level of precision of NATO uh, missiles, that certainly would have um, entailed millions of uh, human. Uh, losses. That uh, realization of that um, made um, Colonel Kupinski uh, to act. Initially, he wanted to um, uh, reform the system from within. That wasn't possible because, in spite of um, peaceful rhetoric, it was an in inherently aggressive uh, system. He turned to um, cooperate with the uh, with the CIA, and um, he was, I can say, valued uh, not only as an intelligence source but also as a uh, an analyst later on when he when he um, uh, was transferred to the um, uh, US. But uh, what was the um, uh, impact on his uh, actions on the NATO's um, um, posture? We can uh, we, uh, well um, one uh, um, uh, one area was uh, certainly the uh, nuclear. Uh, deterrence and and um, uh, the area of arms control was the so-called dual track uh, approach where uh, when in 1979 uh, NATO in realization of the consequences of the deployment of SS-20 to Eastern Europe um, declared uh, deployment of uh, reciprocal measures but also which, which, which came in the form of uh, Pershing-2 and uh, Gryphons, but also uh, 
through the offer of uh, arms control uh, deal uh, to the Soviets, which later on came into fruition. And incidentally, uh, some of the sources claim that one of the reasons that uh, persuaded Gorbachev to um, enter uh, those um, um, negotiations were uh, showing him um, some of the intelligence that was uh, transferred by Kolonsky, namely locations of uh, strategic command and control and, uh, installations. Um, his, um, um, his influence was um, was very important to de to uh, develop the understanding of the in inter indications and warnings. Basically, an idea how the Soviets would, would mobilize for uh, for the war, which suddenly um, um, allowed for some level of uh, uh, understanding of the Warsaw Pact, but also uh, would, would um, help uh, de-escalate the, uh, the situation uh, had those intentions not yet been put into into place. I've already mentioned the command and control installations. He, he passed on information on um, hundreds of uh, advanced um, uh, weapon systems, um, uh, manuals, uh, uh, plans, um, and 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 uh, um, uh, concepts. Uh, eventually, that led to um, other um, uh, developments within within NATO. I've already mentioned the area of nuclear uh, deterrence and arms control, but uh, what was pro probably most uh, successful was. Uh, the influence on NATO's conventional uh, posture, because um, his intelligence made NATO decision makers realize that um, stopping Soviets with conventional arms wasn't infeasible, um, and that came in in uh, three things. I mean, that re required three uh, areas. The, the first one was uh, increased spending, and uh, around around the turn of 70s and 80s, NATO adopted um, the pledge to spend 3% of the GDP on defense. So one could uh, argue that uh, Colonel Kuklinski was a godfather of the Wales uh, defense uh, pledge of nowadays, which is which comes in 2%, which is anyway a difficult target for, uh, for many countries. Uh, second, a development of new concepts. Uh, of operations, uh, concepts like uh, the LN battle, so basically a concept how to outsmart the Soviet offensive to being more mobile, uh, to possessing more uh, uh, situational awareness, and a new technical uh, system that would back up the, uh, those new concepts, uh, which came from also in additional concept uh, uh, of the fo follow-on forces attack. In this concept, the NATO would employ long-range, precise, conventional strike, um, again backed up by uh, very effective uh, intelligence surveillance and, and reconnaissance, and would delay the second and third echelon of the Soviet um, uh, forces. All in all, this was a, a crucial um, crucial contribution that helped to um, decrease the risk of the war, decrease the, the, the risk of possible war uh, escalating into the nuclear uh, level and uh, prompted uh, the Soviets to enter arms um, control uh, negotiations. Um, I would argue that uh, this legacy is also important nowadays when we are facing um, a um, very significant Russian buildup of dual, dual capable uh, missiles that hold uh, Europe um, at risk. Thank you very much. Uh, and that's very, thank you very much indeed for this uh, in-depth analysis of the security environment of actions uh, taken by Colonel, Colonel Richard Kuklinski. And now allow me to, to, to strike slightly more emotional note. Uh, uh, in just two days, we commemorate the 50th anniversary of so-called so uh, Polish seashore events. Uh, it was uh, 
the protests, peaceful protests uh, of Polish workers, uh, uh, mostly shipyards workers, big uh, factories workers in 1970. That was uh, in most bloody way uh, cracked by by uh, the communist uh, rule in Poland, and surely. This event, together with uh, uh, the knowledge uh, that Colonel Kuklinski absorbed from this professional engagement, triggered uh, surely his his actions. I would like to to invite Filip uh, Franskowiak, considerably uh, young uh, person who dedicated uh, his public uh, life to. Um, cherishing memory of, of Colonel General Richard Kuklinski, um, also uh, taking the legacy of, of uh, uh, the outstanding dissident, uh, Polish dissident, uh, pro the late Professor Józef uh, Szaniawski. It was Józef Szaniawski who, who started to expose the role of Ryszard Kukliński to, to, to pop Polish public life. He was the first uh, head of uh, the museum, the, the, the chamber dedicated to the memory of, of uh, Ryszard Kukliński and, uh, and also uh, the author of excellent uh, um, book on, on uh, actions by Ryszard Kupinski. Once more, without much ado, I'd like to give the floor to, to Filip Franskowiak. Thank you, Chairman Potega, for uh, inviting me uh, to this uh, conference. It's a great honor to be together with uh, such a um, honorable guests and participants. Uh, saying hello from the General Kuklinski Museum in Warsaw, I'm uh, sitting by the Richard Kuklinski uh, desk from the uh, Polish Communist Staff uh, General from 70s. Uh, Richard Kuklinski uh, was uh, sending uh, the, those documents that um, Ambassador Szatkowski was talking about uh, between 1972 and 1981. And um, Kuklinski uh, sent about 40,000 pages of Warsaw Pact documents. It's, it's extremely important to, to, to underline this Warsaw Pact, which means, in fact, Soviet documents. Uh, we have, I think, some uh, special video presentation that I would like to uh, ask um, and use uh, to, to, to present you uh, how those uh, attacks were uh, planned by the Soviets. So the uh, first attack from the Polish uh, and Soviet territory by the mid-range, uh, mid-range, um, nuclear attack on the mobile uh, platforms on the Western Europe. Uh, mostly this plan by the Polish soldiers uh, were uh, the attack on Western Germany, Denmark, uh, Belgium and the Netherlands. Uh, then, in the third day, uh, there were plans to go straight via the corridor of Poland by the uh, second echelon, uh, which means two million Soviet soldiers uh, capturing the whole Europe. The first, uh, the first echelon was half a million Polish soldiers, which were called by the uh, Ambassador Szatkowski as a cannon fodder, which was right. So, if there is a, an attack, uh, you must uh, you must be sure that there can be a counter attack. So those uh, strategies from Warsaw Pact knew uh, that there will be an attack 
to stop this second echelon, those Soviet soldiers, at the Polish territory by, uh, by the nuclear attack, nuclear weapon, and also the chemical uh, weapons. Not only uh, on the Polish territory, but also other uh, Central Europe Warsaw Pact states. So Kukliński knew that uh, as a chief of the uh, strategic um, uh, department in the, uh, in the the staff general of communist army, he wanted to save Poland and also the other Central Europe states. That is why he decided to, in 1972 to contact with the uh, U.S. Army, uh, send a letter uh, to the U.S. Embassy in Bonn, uh, and asking uh, for a contact uh, during his uh, espionage yacht cruise, because he, because he organized a special espionage yacht cruise, uh, spying yacht cruise uh, to the Western uh, Along the western uh, shore uh, of the of the of the uh, North uh, Sea, and they met with him. In fact, there were not uh, U.S. soldiers; they were um, CIA officers, uh, which is uh, which started it, it started uh, the most vital uh, mission. Uh, Kukliński was called as the most vital uh, source for the United States during the Cold War, and uh, those mis this mission uh, lasted for uh, nine years, between 1972 and 1981. Uh, Kukliński uh, also uh, sent documents on the implementing of the martial uh, law uh, in Poland. And <clears throat> Ambassador Szatkowski said that uh, none of uh, all of those documents are uh, declassified. That's true. Uh, you can find those documents um, that Kukliński said between 1980 and 1981, uh, partially from 1979 also, at the CIA website where is a uh, uh, Richard Kuklinski uh, library, uh, and there are some uh, of his uh, documents uh, from that time. Also, uh, you can find information from the uh, crucial uh, periods, uh, crucial moments of the Cold War, uh, where the Kuklinski uh, reports were significant. For example, during the call uh, of the President Jimmy Carter, to Leonid Brezhnev in December uh, 1980. Um, President Jimmy Carter uh, called uh, to um, uh, Leonid Brezhnev and warning him uh, to not crossing uh, the Polish border uh, by the Red Army. Uh, that was based, uh, the information were uh, based on the uh, Kuklinski report. The other extremely important uh, source is, uh, uh, is the report, or rather I would say reports from the talks, from the negotiations between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail uh, Gorbachev uh, in Reykjavik in 1986, in October. Uh, they were uh, negotiating the meat, uh, among the other things, uh, the meat range uh, uh, missiles with uh, uh, nuclear warheads uh, in Europe and in Asia. And um, President Reagan did agree for uh, uh, those mobiles, uh, mobile platform in, in Asia. Uh, because he knew that uh, Soviet Russia can bring those mobile platforms with nuclear weapons to uh, closer to the Europe, uh, European borders. And he said, I see, I saw, so the maps uh, that present how you attack the Central Europe uh, states. And uh, Re President Reagan was talking about those maps that uh, Kukliński sent to the United States. 
I was asked uh, to uh, uh, share also some uh, private uh, memories. Uh, so I have to say uh, that uh, you can see now the map from 1979 uh, presenting attacks for the Western Europe and also uh, expected attacks of the NATO for the Polish territory. Uh, I, was, I wanted to say that uh, I met for the first time Richard Kupinski in 1998 when I was 18 years old. Uh, but more important uh, in this story was my father, that, that uh, Chairman Fotiga mentioned. Uh, my father was sentenced uh, as a Radio Free Europe correspondent. He was sentenced by the communist regime for 10 years and was called by this regime uh, as a uh, United States of America spy. And he was the last political uh, prisoner uh, released from this from the prison in this, in December in December 1989, and he became Richard Kopinski plenipotentiary. Uh, since 1982, they were cooperating together. Unfortunately, what is uh, very important, talking about the democracy, the young democracy in Central uh, Eastern Europe, Kopinski uh, was. Um, acquitted, acquitted in 1997. He was waiting eight years after the uh, communism collapsed. He was waiting eight years to, to be a free man uh, here in Poland. He was uh, he ex escaped from Poland uh, in 1981, um, just before the uh, martial. Law, he escaped to the United States, so he was sentenced to death in 1984 uh, in absentia. Uh, one more person I wanted to mention, uh, Mr. David Ford. Uh, he was a CIA officer cooperating with uh, Richard Kuklinski, uh, helping to uh, finish this mission. Uh, of Richard Kuklinski, and then, and after that, in uh, from since 1981, they became friends in the United States. Uh, Mr. Foden uh, passed away last year, and had, as his daughter told me, had Richard Kuklinski uh, photography next to his bed. One more important uh, sentence: Mr. David Foden became a, a chief of. Soviet Eastern Europe Department in CIA uh, after he finished his mission with Kuklinski. It shows uh, how uh, important was cooperation with Richard Kuklinski and Richard Kuklinski reports. Once more, thank you very much and hope to, hope to see all of you in uh, Richard Kuklinski Museum in Warsaw. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Franz Kowiak, thank you very much indeed. Surely it is not our last uh, joint event in previous legislature of the European Parliament. We were able to present the exhibition uh, dedicated to, to General Richard Kuklinski. Uh, it was extremely successful event. Uh, and uh, exhibition during one week of, of, of presentation was visited really by, by many uh, members and, and, and members of, of uh, the staff, both uh, uh, officials of the European Parliament, but, but also um, uh, assistants, accredited assistants and, and, and uh, members of auxiliary staff. Uh, so the topic is extremely important. Actually, I must say that all events mentioned today somehow intertwined in, in uh, my life uh, because, of course, I, I spent my, my since early, earliest childhood, my time in, in Gdańsk. So... I remember uh, both uh, 1970, it was was linked uh, to my family uh, as, as well. And of course, I remember uh, the introduction of, of imposition of, of martial law. 
and how much we were were triggered by by listening to 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 uh, is successful escape of of uh, colonel richard kuklinski because we we learned about this when he was um uh, sentenced to death by communist uh, rulers now i would like to once more to reintroduce my two dear colleagues uh, uh, sasha alexander sasha vondra uh, former Czech, uh, Czechoslovak uh, dissident and, and very important person also currently in our, in the European uh, Parliament and Hermann Turch. Uh, different perspectives. Uh, uh, I will start with uh, asking Sasha about his perception of those times, not only of uh, Colonel Kuklinski, but his personal, his own perception of the situation in in, in uh, uh, Czechoslovakia and and uh, uh, the the perspectives for for changes for for uh, democratic uh, developments in our region, and then I will ask. Uh, um, Herman Terch, uh, Spanish uh, MEP and former journalist, uh, to for for his uh, memories. Yeah. So, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna, for inviting me to to this uh, important debate and to say a few remarks about uh, the importance of uh, General uh, Kuklinski. In fact, you know, for the first time when I had to got to know a, a little bit about him was already in the 80s and certainly, you know, we were glad any kind of a failure of the communist system uh, was appreciated. But uh, the reality is that the real details about his importance, I got to know much uh, later. It was in 1997 when I came uh, as a Czech, uh, Czech ambassador to, uh, to Washington uh, you know, after we uh, got the consent by the U.S. government uh, to, to enlarge NATO and and uh, and and to go in, uh, I was sent uh, to take care of the successful ratification in in the U.S. Senate, uh, and it was uh, not certain at all in this time. Uh, we were working hard with our Polish colleague there, was Jerzy Kosminski. And we were desperately looking for some real positive uh, example how uh, we uh, contributed to uh, the protection of the West uh, freedom and democracy um, uh, from from our side. And um, it was exactly the time, as as uh, Philip has said, that you know he was pardoned uh, in, in 1997. So uh, his name uh, came to the spotlight. And um, um, I have to tell you that uh, the story which uh, has been presented to the American public uh, uh, has helped us very, very much in uh, convincing uh, uh, the American senator to vote yes in favor of uh, the NATO enlargement. Because really this, um, uh, the story of his defection uh, the magnitude of, of uh, the useful information which he has provided, and I don't want to repeat what has already been mentioned, uh, was really extraordinary. So I, I remember this uh, until today, uh, uh, as uh, it was yesterday. And in fact, maybe my second point is this. You know, there were two famous uh, defectors from, uh, from Eastern Camp, not taking now the rational sides, that was Colonel uh, Richard Kuklinski, and there was General Jan Shaina from Czechoslovakia. And, uh, you know, in in this late 90s or the second half of 90s, I made already some research on, on Shaina, whether we can uh, use also his example uh, as a positive contribution. But uh, here the story was a bit different um, because. The reality was, you know, if somebody wants to uh, to have a confirmation of a certain stereotype that the Czechs are 
the opportunists, while the Polish are the real fighters and patriots, then can serve the, 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 the story of those two military men just to upheld this, uh, <laughs> this uh, certain difference, because Shaina was in fact a part uh, of the establishment before 1968. Uh, he was doing uh, uh, the business with the son of President Novotny. He was stealing uh, various agriculture commodities and then was trying to uh, to sell them, uh, uh, you know, to behave like a capitalist in a totalitarian society. Once uh, Novotny has fell down in early 68 as a president, um, Shaina was facing uh, the imprisonment by Dubček simply because of, uh, of his criminal activities. And to avoid this imprisonment, he, he escaped to the West. Um, but, and certainly, you know, to prove his, uh, his usefulness, his, his, uh, his contribution. So he bombed them with the various informations. And it was a mixture of the real informations. For example, uh, how the Soviets were also planning some attack on uh, Austria with, uh, you know, in the direction of the Tito's Yugoslavia. This uh, a complete fairy tales, uh, for example, uh, how the Czechoslovak and the Soviets were testing on uh, the American POWs in, in the Korean Wars. So I reached the conclusion that Shaina uh, cannot uh, uh, help us as Kuklinski was really help, helping us. <laughs> but then uh, once uh, the hearings uh, uh, about the NATO enlargement reached uh, uh, the stage of the Senate committees. Suddenly, I was bombed by the Americans. Please, Sasha, told us something from your archives. What uh, has happened to the American PLWs in, in, in Korea as uh, Shaina was testifying? <laughs> so, uh, look, I think those two defectors uh, can tell us uh, a lot about, about uh, um, the realities of the Cold War, and and really, I have full admiration for what uh, General Kuklinski did because it was an extraordinary achievement, and I very much appreciate also the book and what are you now doing? Because look, uh, the, the time to time the things are got, going forgotten. Just uh, for, for trying to prepare myself for this evening. I put the Kuklinski in the Google, and <laughs> if you do that, uh, you will you will see first Richard Kuklinski, some kind of an American mass murder, and you need to go much deeper <laughs> to find uh, this uh, heroic uh, uh, activity of uh, Richard uh, Kuklinski, who helps us to to win. Uh, Board so thank you very much again for for doing this. Sasha, thank you very much indeed for mentioning uh, even the word uh, defector because uh, I wanted also to 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 touch upon this uh, topic. Usually, when we think about defectors. Uh, we, we see somebody who is rather interested in privileges uh, given by, by the more successful or, or even by financial uh, pers personal achievements. In case of Colonel uh, Kuklinski, it was uh, absolutely obvious for any person who, who, who was dedicated to, to real independence of, of countries of our region. His role was uh, uh, absolutely clear and, yeah. and obvious. Actually, he paid enormous price, enormous price for his yeah, yeah, yeah. Full Full agreement, you know, Shane, yeah. Shaina was defector, uh, Kuklinski was a patriotic hero. Yeah, yeah, that, that is true. Unfortunately, we have still to explain this to, to, to many groups of Polish general public. Uh, 
even so many years uh, after this. Uh, um, the Museum of Richard Kuklinski has an excellent role, and of course, uh, what Józef Szaniawski did. Unfortunately, it was not only uh, sons by, of uh, General Kuklinski that, that perished in, in unclear circumstances, I would say, but, but also we still remember Józef Szaniawski, author of this book, who, who, who simply died. Uh, we do not know circumstances. Uh, in the Polish mountains, he was alone in, in uh, 2012. Uh, so, so I would say that we have still to, to explain the role of Kuklinski to, to people of our region, to, 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 to the world. Uh, he, he was not forgotten because people like ourselves, like Sasha, myself, others, we, we remember him. So I would say he's rather unforgettable than forgotten leader. But surely there are many people like this who, who are worth remembering. Now I'd like to, to, to turn, if you allow me, Sasha, I, I will have a second question to, to, to both of you, but now I would like to, to ask Herman Turch for, for uh, his reflections. Are you there, Herman? Are you already there? I'm sorry, we have to wait uh, a minute. I know that Herman was engaged also he he had to 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 be in affect so so just he's already there okay i'm in good i'm well, here i'm here yeah well <laughs> hello to everybody thank, i have thank you yeah, different you questions all over the places i have to yes have i to know transport problems for brussels and so on okay any okay. case i wanted to be a very short i wanted to to pray my tribute uh, to this hero, to this European hero, to this hero of uh, of liberty. Um, uh, for us, uh, I mean, the Polish fight is a is an enormous, important, and pedago pedagogic uh, a message for all, the whole Europe. We are seeing it now as well. I mean, you can extrapolate <laughs> many many of the positions uh, that we we are fighting for today. With the positions we were fighting uh, uh, in 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 years in in past years, um, and uh, I want only to say that in this dark times of uh, of the Cold War, in this moments where there was no hope at all, where many people said, "Well, we are not going to see our relatives in the West till the West becomes communist." No. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was yeah that was the position in many for many pe people which I visited in Hungary in the seventies end of the seventies they were saying well we'll see if Spain, if Spain becomes a socialist country maybe then we can visit you but not not in another there was no no imagination of having a return to capitalism or something like that, so that there were people in this hopelessness fighting and risking the life again uh, for this uh, for this uh, liberty in Europe. It's, it's a, such an impressive uh, uh, position uh, and and way of 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 fighting for the for the country that we in Spain, that we have a very different story, but we have our fight for liberty as well. And we had our dark times, and we are in a very dark time now. Uh, we, we, um, we have to look for inspiration in, in these figures which have been fighting in Europe for the same ideal. That, that's why I, I, from Spain, I thank you very much for having me here, for sharing this moment. I mean, I know Vondra, eh, I, I was in the 80s in, in Czechoslovakia as well. I was in Poland. I was in, in, in Czechoslovakia. I was thinking now about Dean Spear and about so many people in, 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 in this eh, eh, um, times 
where really the hope had broken up and there was a movement already, but there was movement because of the polls, because it had started in the 81, uh, had started this movement in Poland that would, uh, would at last bring us the liberty in the whole Eastern Europe. That's why I thank always Poland. <laughs> And and I I I remember I remember these times and I, I as I say I, I my tribute to to this to this hero who is Kuklinski and and to so many others uh, who had made this this possible. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much indeed, Herman. Actually. I would like Sasha to contradict you to some, <laughs> uh, <laughs> speaking about stereotypes, uh, maybe in this case that you presented and referring to, to Colonel Kuklinski, you may be right, but actually uh, knowing all stereotypes uh, about nations of our region, we, we still remember uh, the Czech Czechoslovak uh, opposition and and very very brave uh, uh, fight in difficult circumstances because also to some extent in Poland uh, the tradition was alive alive it was to some extent bro broader. Um, perceived and and uh, I wouldn't say it was easier because uh, because of course uh, um, the 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 price was always uh, very high in, in all countries of the region, but but certainly we remember as well in 1968. Uh, we, we we commemorate this uh, and and we are ashamed uh, all to 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 large extent also although not uh, uh, many of us were very clear about the situation at the time please tell us uh, just just uh, uh, from the point of view of participating uh, participating person about the uh, position in, in Czech Republic. We we do not have much time, but, but I think it's worth mentioning. No, uh, thank you very much for uh, your uh, appreciation of the Czech uh, data. I was a little bit joking, but I was also uh, a, a little bit disgusted last week because I was expecting the Czech Prime Minister to support the polls in 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 uh, to face this uh, pressure by the eu and because he has his own problems so he was hidden somewhere behind the corner instead of supporting you so that was uh, the, uh, the expression of a certain czech opportunism but uh, back to 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 our common fight against the communists uh, in uh, the 1970s 80s yes look uh, i think that this uh solidarity the mutual solidarity mutual enforcement by the dissident across the borders that was absolutely fundamental for us i would never forget my first trip to poland in the summer of 1980 when the solidarity 1981 when the solidarity was in in the peak my trip you know from Wroclaw via Częstochowa, krakow warsaw to gdansk you know uh, for somebody who came from communist Czechoslovakia, you know, where it was in the midst of the darkness, and suddenly it was like a transfusion with oxygen for us, you know, to see this um, uh, uh, outburst of uh, freedom in, in neighboring country. So since that, uh, Poland has always served as as an example, you know, what uh, we should do to take the courage. And uh, yes, uh, Czechoslovak Polish solidarity is <inaudible> over the, 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 the border. It all shaped, you know, our our experience and help us to, to defeat the communists. Yeah, you are absolutely right. I, I remember this time of natural as well. I was... Uh, 
at the end of my studies in, in Gdańsk, at Gdańsk University, and I started first as volunteer in, in the foreign department of Solidarność and then uh, an employee of, of this department. And I, I still think, I, I'm a grandmother now, and I still think that it was the most beautiful work I ever had, uh, including my, 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 my uh, term in office as foreign minister, frequent uh, uh, MEP uh, actions and, and so on. So we call this a festival of Solidarność and it was, you, you are right, it was this perception of freedom uh, in, in in between or in the communist circumstances uh, in 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 this type of of uh, country it was amazing uh, uh, it's of, of course the dark dark time of of martial law uh, followed and and quite quite quickly followed but still we remember this um Har Harman, uh, can you remember the atmosphere in the West uh, during that time and, and the um, uh, refer referring about our region, not Soviet, but uh, countries mm -hmm. of the Soviet bloc and uh, eventual events uh, like, like uh, uh, raising of, of dissidents in, in uh, Czechoslovakia, Solidarność movement in Poland. How was it uh, referred to in, in Spain? In well, Spanish, in, yeah. Spain, in Spain, we had, a, a, we had a, a very, it was a very confusing time because we were in, in the transition out of, of, of Franco's uh, regime. And then we had some, some factors where you said the, the communists were very well seen, eh? and and the socialism suddenly um, many people who had been in the regime very comfortable and had never had political uh, ambitions in the regime uh, and had not been opposition and and so on. The opposition was a very very tiny minority in the regime of Franco. It has to be said, and suddenly there were all this kind of anti-Frankist. Uh, were rise starting, they started mostly after Franco's death, of course. And in when when freedom started, people started to say that they were freedom fighters. Uh, before that, um, uh, they were not, they were absent. Um, but this is well, a logical phenomenon. I see others, I can remember being in Germany and being in Austria. Uh, uh, and and in France, but mainly in Germany, the whole movement against uh, the the double decision of the NATO, which was a very worrying uh, movement that you had, and then you had these courageous decisions by Helmut Schmidt, eh, uh, where, 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 who holds the position of NATO in a very difficult situation in his in, in his party and in in general in in Germany in 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 a very in very courageous way which now uh, people don't um, seem in Germany to to value as much as they as they probably should uh, because it had uh, it has um, it has it it was very very important uh, for things that ha that happened later uh, what was the disposition in against against all this demagoguery and all this propaganda in in mostly uh, fabricated also in the Soviet Union and in uh, and from the terminals of the Soviet of the Soviet so-called empire uh, in front of that there were some uh, Western Forces, Thatcher, Reagan. Well, then you had Jean Paul, the Pole uh, in the Vatican, which was an, such an important factor in all 
in all what happened. But as I say, the, the, the courage of Helmut Schmidt before that, the people who were cold-blooded, seeing uh, really the importance of, of resisting temptations which were very present in the West and which are present again now. As you as you see in 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 whole Europe, so uh, it was it was a time where things were moving. Nobody knew, as I say, as I said before, nobody knew that really the the, the collapse that was coming. No, although although all who visited regularly, as I did, and uh, all people who lived there, of course, he knew that. The, the, that they were the, the states were were collapsing in the sense that nothing worked again. No, I can remember in the house of it's. I think it's in the in the street Fiskalna, Fiskalna uh, Ulitsa, uh, where um, where um, Kapuscinski lived. Uh, in the house of Kapuscinski, Kapuscinski told me. I mean, it's a miracle. I was I speak about the eighties. It was 85 or something. It, it's a miracle that this tram comes by. I mean, that there is a worker that goes in the early in the morning, goes to the garage, takes the tram out, connects it, and puts it to work. I mean, it's always an absolute miracle that something moves, that something moves in the system, in the system. But, uh, but from outside, they were seeing the Soviet a style of of communist place and the and the official rhetoric was that there was no way out of socialism there was a way out of capitalism but no way out of socialism till it came mm -hmm. okay, okay. okay. <laughs> remembering this time i think that we never lost hope and and not only hope who we Many many poles decided to 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 work uh, to to this end to 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 obtain uh, eventually independence and sovereignty to regain uh, regain it. When we speak about uh, external support, I think that it is worth mentioning from the perspective of foreign department of Solidarność. Of course, the support of, of the, the late Holy Pope John Paul II was uh, of vital importance to us. Actually, we think that uh, this out, outburst of Solidarność was only possible because of, of earlier visit of John Paul II. Actually, when we remember niece of General Jaruzelski trembling, and we saw this in television, his uh, nervousness was visible, mm -hmm. was visible while uh, greeting John Paul II, but all, all uh, homilies were so important <clears throat> to us, do, do not uh, be afraid. Uh, it it was uh, really important. In until now, in Gdańsk, we lay rests uh, many times a year uh, um, by the monument, a joint monument of President Reagan and uh, uh, Pope John Paul II. We also remember Margaret Thatcher. Uh, she visited uh, not Poland uh, towards the end of, of, of communism in 1988 and her visit was extremely important because she officially acknowledged uh, Polish, Polish uh, uh, independence fighters. She visited the grave of, of uh, um, priest uh, was killed by, by communist secret service during martial law. So, so it was it was extremely important uh, to all of us. Of course, we remember. You have mentioned uh, Germany. We much more remember German uh, society, ordinary people that were extremely. Uh, 
touched by Poland's fight for independence. Uh, I, it was not so much perceived in uh, relationship to German elites, but certainly German ordinary people were uh, visibly very friendly vis-a-vis -vis, vis during this time of, of Solidarność uh, festival and later martial law, much sympathy to this. But, but I have to acknowledge, of course, uh, predominantly also UK, so our allies within the uh, ECR. I was responsible for, for, for relationship with uh, uh, Great Britain, with UK, and international organizations within the Solidarność Foreign Department. And I remember then that elites, ordinary people, trade <coughs> that are sometimes different uh, when you speak and see Jeremy Corbyn, it looks uh, different, but I think that at that time it was important. Also, I have to, to mention France and French uh, society, Netherlands, Belgium hosting later on Polish exile, Solidarność exiles and 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 granting the place for for uh, the external office of Solidarność uh, in the West. It was uh, the main office was in Brussels during martial law. And it was very important because it was uh, the, the 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 place uh, also working towards the, the the many other places. Also Italy. And, and, and Solidarność representatives uh, then. So it was all over the world, uh, but surely most, most important was also the transatlantic uh, alliance to US and Canada at that time. Ladies and gentlemen, we gathered uh, this evening to commemorate uh, uh, the late General uh, Richard Kupiński, Polish patriot, Polish uh, uh, high-ranking officer uh, who, who decided to, to bravely uh, start lonely mission because certainly when you read about this, uh, it was unbelievably lonely mission. I hope that his uh, achievements, his deeds uh, are better known uh, to general pu public, both in Poland and outside, internationally. He was worth this and, and we owe him really a lot. Surely, as mentioned by, by Sasha, also most probably our, our current security. Uh, and, and staying uh, within uh, the, the most successful defense alliance uh, in the world's history. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. I would like to thank all our uh, outstanding speakers, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Tomasz Szatkowski, Mr. Um, uh, Filip Franzkow, Director of, of General Kuklinski Museum in Warsaw, and my dear ECR colleagues, members of the European Parliament, uh, Sasha Vondra and Herman Terch. Thank you very much indeed. Stay safe. Bye. Thanks. Take care. Goodbye. Uh, pleasure. <laughs>